Hello guys, this is uh, Dr. Palanay Pramanikam. In this video, we're going to talk about the root cause of all problems, root cause of obesity, root cause of diabetes. In my opinion, if we can fix this, there will be no diseases at all. Let's dive deep into it. If you think you got anything out of this video, please don't subscribe. Please consider donation to our non-profit organization called Aishwaryam Trust. We run this in Madurai for hospice patients where they have only six months to live. We provide 24-7 free medical care, food, shelter, free of cost. You can also donate to Vanna Madakal Foundation, which is a 501c3 organization here in US so that your donations are tax deductible. So as a gastroenterologist, I can clearly tell you that the root cause of all the problems is the bacteria that is prevalent all over your intestine right from your oral cavity all the way to your colon. These are all tiny little microorganisms which plays a major role in how you look, how you think, what you eat. Studies are showing that your immunity level might be dependent on this gut bacteria as well. The way that how you respond to a pandemic like COVID, the way that how you respond to a viral infection, a bacterial infection, everything will be dependent upon these bacteria called gut bacteria. More important, I'm here to tell you that this is the main reason for your belly fat, for your obesity, for your diabetes, for your sugar cravings. If your gut has more bad bacteria, they thrive and form a city called obesity. If your gut bacteria is bad, it creates signals, influences your brain to make you think that you are hungry, crave for foods that you usually don't and that leads to increased calories, increased belly fat, increased obesity and that is what we are dealing with right now. The research on gut bacteria started somewhere around 2008. We have 15 years of research and now it is very clear that patients who are obese generally have a bad bacterial population overgrowth in their intestine. Compared to people who are lean, who are healthy, they have a good proportion of bacteria in their small intestine. Bad bacteria loves my friend Saranokuma's intestine because it looks like a sweet stall with different types of sweets stacked in an orderly fashion. The bacteria can choose 100 grams of any kind of sweet. His bad bacteria gets free home delivery of all the sweets sweet gift hampers during festival seasons because as he celebrates all festivals by saying I am not religious I'm spiritual. There are trillions of these organisms more than the number of cells in your human body. When you look under the microscope these organisms are tightly packed end to end side to side looks like a tightly packed cargo package. We just need to make sure that we are not dancing on the top of the cargo like chaya chaya. This package not only contains bacteria but virus fungus and multiple small tiny parasites as well. It is a complex dynamic ecosystem more complex than American politics. More importantly, this set of bacteria can be hereditary because it can be passed on from generation to generation. If the parents are obese, the likelihood of kids getting obese is very high. Studies have shown that the same amount of gut bacteria can be seen even in the fourth or fifth generation. There should be a matrimonial website called guts.com where the marriage has to be based on whether you have good bacteria or bad bacteria. And the tagline should be marry me if you have guts. So we keep on talking about this bacteria where do we get this from what kind of bacteria we're going to get in our intestine is decided right from our birth when a baby is born through normal vaginal delivery it swallows the normal bacteria in the birth canal which is absolutely good for the intestines of that newborn baby so when it comes to the world that good bacteria lays a solid foundation in the intestine so that it can pick and choose what kind of bacteria it is going to be living with at the same time if the baby is born through cesarean section the baby is not exposed to all the good bacteria in the birth canal so it loses the advantage of having a strong foundation right from the birth. Studies have shown that kids born through c-section or an increased risk of obesity compared with kids born through normal vaginal delivery. This doesn't mean that c-section is bad, hospital is trying to make money. This is just a general observation of how important your gut bacteria is. Again there are multiple factors to play with if the baby is formula fed or breastfed. Babies who are breastfed have good gut bacteria compared to formula feeding. After hearing this, my friend Saranda Kumar was born through cesarean section, goes to his mom and then says that I want to be born through vaginal delivery now. He is 40 years old. Again, there is no one factor. There is multiple factors involved, including if you have pets like dogs or cats in your household when you are growing up because you are getting exposed to that different set of microbiomes, which might be very good for you as well. Studies have shown that babies who have had multiple caregivers and not just with mom and dad, they have better variety of gut bacteria compared to the baby raised by just parents alone. I have a feeling that it might be a reason why kids are more immune when they grow up in India compared to kids when they grow up 
here in US because the number of caregivers is low. Another interesting finding is that if a kid has not received any antibiotics during the first year of life, their gut bacteria is so strong compared to kids who have received antibiotics. Logistically speaking, antibiotics must have killed both good and bad bacteria in the gut which will take some time to repopulate again. So summarizing the research so far, if the kid is born through cesarean section, if the kid is being formula fed, if the kid is getting treated with antibiotics in the first year of life, the amount of good bacteria in their intestine is much lower than the other group. This emphasized the importance of how good the gut bacteria should be. If Romans knew this concept, they would have renamed Julius Caesar as Julius Normal. And the development of good bacteria doesn't stop within the first year of life. The foundation is laid during the first year, but multiple factors determine what kind of bacteria you have in your intestine based on your dietary and lifestyle changes. The reason that the strong foundation is very important because good bacteria in your intestine creates something called mucus which lines up the intestine and they are closely and tightly packed so that bad bacteria doesn't enter into the intestine. The main problem happens when this tightly packed mucus junctions are disturbed and when there is an opening and through that opening bad bacteria sneaks in similar to a bad political guy sneaking into a good political party and damaging it completely. And if we can make sure that this lining is strong and there is no gap in between, we have hit a jackpot for our long-term health. The single most important factor which determines how tightly packed this mucus lining is your diet. If your diet contains a lot of fiber, then the junction is tightly packed and there is no opening at all. If your diet doesn't have any fiber at all, it is easy for the mucus lining to get separated. Multiple studies have shown that if you are a vegetarian and following a plant-based diet, the likelihood of fiber intake is higher which makes these mucus lining junctions very tighter which will lead to a stronger foundation of your gut bacteria. Thanks to fibrous cyber products like Burger King, Pizza Hut, KFC, I am going to start a chain called Fiber King to fight against the cyber crime. Chhi. Fiber crime. This is not something new to us. We are in accordance with our ancestors. In a study about hunter gatherers in Africa, only one of the 20 hunts were successful, which means 90% of their diet are vegetarian based on fruits and plants. They mainly lay on plant sources of calories like fruits, berry, and honey. Of course, when a hunt is successful, they are eating animal based diet, but that is not higher than the plant based diet. It is completely different now. Even if a dow accidentally sits on our window, we catch it and make a soup out of it. These days, the success rate of a hunt is 20 out of 20. If you calculate the fiber intake of these hunter gatherers, it is more than 100 grams of fiber per day. If you look at their long term health, the number of patients with obesity or heart disease is almost zero. The reason is that the complex fibers from these plant based diet releases short chain fatty acids called butyrate, which makes the mucus connections very stronger and tighter. Short chain fatty acids are like the Indian movie director who just takes family based movies uniting everybody together. I told my friends Arunak Kumar that nuts are a wonderful source of fiber and he starts eating 10 nuts per day but still obese because his favorite nut is donut. So does it mean that you shouldn't eat non-vegetarian diet at all? Absolutely not because non-vegetarian diet will give you good quality source of protein. The problem is it doesn't increase the good bacteria and also it doesn't decrease the bad bacteria in the intestine. And usually when you include meat in your diet the fiber content goes down. You can see that clearly in a buffet line. Nobody is standing in the vegetarian line anymore. Everybody is attracted towards the mutton gravy in the non-vegetarian line. This is the new version of Newton's law of gravity. Mutton's law of gravity. And there is a small concern with red meat that when they are heated under high temperatures, it releases chemicals like n nitroso compounds, heterocyclic amines and these chemicals could be potentially carcinogenic, disrupting the mucus barrier. And multiple studies have shown an association between red meat like beef, lamb, pork, chicken thighs with colon cancer. Though it is not a causal effect, there is an association. My patient Aro Kiyasami has a wonderful method. He has decided not to eat meat on Saturdays because of religious reasons. He could not resist the urge to eat and after heating, he puts $1 as a donation to the Hindu temple as a compromise. I always choose any kind of intervention in moderation. Even with fasting, I don't recommend this extended fasting like 72 hour fasting because we don't know how it is going to influence your good and bad gut bacteria as long as you fast for 16 hours a day, I strongly believe that that should be more than enough for all the good benefits that you're going to get. Similar to the moderation concept, you don't have to be a strict vegetarian 
or a strict non-vegetarian, you could be Dr. Palitarian. Let me explain my case, Your Honor. So we know that two things are very important. Number one, your fiber intake. Two, good quality source of protein. So usually there are three meals a day, seven days a week, 21 meals a week. So out of this 21 meals, if we are following our ancestors, 90% should be vegetarian or a plant-based diet, which means 19 of this 21 meals will be vegetarian diet. We need to make sure that the fiber intake is at least more than 25 grams of fiber every day, regardless whether you are a man or a woman. If you can go up to 40 grams or 50 grams, that is even better. But you need to start slowly because your digestive tract has to get adapted to this very slowly. The remaining 10% of the 21 meals, which is two meals per week, you can definitely include meat. While you include meat, the preferred meat is white meat, which will include chicken breast, turkey and fish. Remember, chicken thighs that you see Tamil movie heroes biting is not a white meat, it is a red meat. So being a gastroenterologist, what I do for my gut is I choose 90% of my diet as plant-based diet, which will increase the fiber content in my intestine. This will include mainly whole grains, legumes, lots of fruits and vegetables. And I will make sure that I take at least 25 grams of fiber per day. Usually it is on the higher side. I used to absolutely love all these sodas with artificial sweeteners, but I love my gut bacteria more than that. I absolutely avoid any kind of artificial sweetness. And I try to limit my antibiotics usage as much as possible. Again, once in a while consuming these products is absolutely okay, but it cannot be on a daily basis, weekly basis or more frequently. My friend Saranakuma started following this method. He is looking forward to those two meals per week where he can include meat with so much anticipation. When he is ready, all the birds and animals are so scared to even come out. They better hide behind the vegetable section because that's the only place that he will not search. Again, summarizing your Dr. Palitarian method, 90% of your meals, which is 19 out of 21 meals per week, can be plant-based. Two out of 21 meals, you can include meat, preferably white meat. Please let me know in the comment section whether this method is applicable to you. I'm very, very curious. Remember, there is a saying, go with your gut. It is absolutely important. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.